Welcome to Virtual Book Signing. My name is Bjorn Skaptison, and you've joined us once again at Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining us from, I presume, Germany and Hawaii and Australia and Nome. Uh, all places where we've had people watching virtual book signing send in questions before in the past. Uh, that's the idea of virtual book signing. This is a live streamed book signing. We bring the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop to you in your home. You have a chance to meet the authors. You have a chance to ask questions. As you're watching your video there, you see that there's an instant message field and you can send us questions. Please send your questions uh, during the course of the show and tell us your name and where you're from. Instant message doesn't always tell us where you're from. We want to shout out to you and thank you. But feel free to send us questions. Feel free to order the books, uh, a book or two or three or five, however many you need to fill your Christmas list. And uh, the authors will sign them and we will ship them out to you. That's what virtual book signing is. We have a great show today. Great show with great authors and great books. And so let's get right to it. Uh, we're going to concentrate on the Civil War today. The first, first book we're going to look at today, uh, first one I want to talk about, is The Siege of Petersburg, The Battles for the Weldon Railroad, August 1864. The author is John Horn. Uh, and uh, the book is from uh, Savas Beatty Publishers. It is 372 pages. The cost is $32.95. Uh, now we're going to talk to John in a minute, uh, but uh, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He earned his Juris Doctor from Columbia Law School. He practices law in Chicago and lives in Oak Forest, Illinois, with his wife and law partner, uh, H. Elizabeth Kelly. Uh, previously, John has written uh, The Destruction of the Weldon Railroad and the Petersburg Campaign, and he co-edited Civil War Talks, The Further Reminiscences of George S. Bernard and His Fellow Veterans. John has also published articles for Civil War Times Illustrated and America's Civil War. We're going to talk to John in just a minute. Uh, but before that, I want to introduce the other book, the other fine work that we have on the program today. And this is... Uh, uh, Civil War Chicago, Eyewitness to History. It's a, it's a documentary history of Chicago in the Civil War. Uh, it is from the University of Ohio Press, 308 pages and illustrated. The editors are Theodore Karamansky and Eileen McMahon, and I'll tell you about uh, your editors here. Uh, Ted Karamansky is a professor of history at Loyola University Chicago, my alma mater. Uh, where he founded and directs the public history program. Uh, he's the author of seven books, including Rally Round the Flag, Chicago and the Civil War, Schooner Passage, Sailing Ships and the Lake Michigan Frontier, and then most recently, Blackbird's Song, Andrew J. Blackbird and the Odawa People. Odawa? Got it. Got it. All right. Um, also editing on this volume, Eileen M. McMahon, is a professor of history at Lewis University. Uh, she holds a doctorate in history from Loyola University Chicago. Go Ramblers! <laughs> and she is the author of What Parish Are You From? A Chicago Irish Community and Race Relations. Uh, she's also co-author of Northwoods River, the St. Croix Valley, and the Upper Midwest History. And Eileen is the editor of the Journal of the Illinois State Historical Society. Uh, so, let's meet our authors and talk about their books. We're going to spend the next hour talking about the Civil War in Chicago and the Siege of Petersburg, uh, or more specifically, one specific episode of the Siege of Petersburg. And so, John, uh, let me ask you, first off, could you... Uh, Get us very quickly just a short description of uh, why you wanted to write a book about the Battle of the Weldon, these battles for the Weldon Railroad, these 18, August of 1864 campaign. Well, the simplest answer is that nobody had written about them before in, in the context of a whole operation because the fighting from August 14th 
to the 25th hung together as one operation. Okay. And we had, uh, we had uh, Richard Summers on the program uh, about nine months ago, and uh, he's famous for writing his book, Richmond Redeemed. It's considered one of the great uh, battle narratives in American literature. And he writes about the fifth, Grant's fifth campaign against Petersburg. Is this, is this book going to be about Grant's fourth Correct. attempt? Is that the way you define that, that fighting? Yes, that, it, it is called the, the fourth offensive at Petersburg. Okay, and then the battles, we're, basically the battles we're talking about are going to be, uh, what are the battle titles? The second Deep Bottom. Okay. Then there are a number of titles for what I call Globe Tavern, but I, I chose Globe Tavern. Yeah. You could call it Yellow Tavern, Six Mile House, Blick Station. One author called it the No Name Battle. <laughs> and then finally, their second ream station. So there were three major actions during the period of August 14 to August 25th, 1864, at Petersburg. Great, great. And for the folks at home, the uh, one thing I've noticed about the writing about the siege of Petersburg, the Petersburg campaign, as it's sometimes called, is that we have battle. We have all of these battles in the Civil War, and all of these battles have books about them, series of books. So Gettysburg has books, Shiloh has books. Petersburg is this huge operation with so many battles in them that each one of them could be its own, have its own battles, its own books, its own histories. But only now in the late part of the 20th century, early part of the 21st century, are historians really looking at the individual battles. And so I think that's one reason why this is such a valuable book. Petersburg is not just a one big Battle. It's a series of engagements, and each of them can be written about and thought about in its own way. Uh, Ted and Eileen, thank you for coming on the show. Um, and Civil War, Chicago. Why was... It's a tough question for me to ask, because I think about Civil War in Chicago all the time. But why... <laughs> uh, uh, what's... Uh, why... Why do we need a documentary history of the, of the history of Chicago and the Civil War and the effect of the Civil War on Chicago? Well, if people think about 19th century Chicago, when they think of history in Chicago, they think of the Great Fire. Mm -hmm. And the Great Fire is, you know, I'm from the south side, so no fire there. <laughs> it's one of these north side, you know, whiny things. Uh, but this... Yeah. But the Civil War is a much more important event. You know, there's not big monuments to this Chicago fire, but every day we interact with the memory of the Civil War in Chicago. We drive through Grant Park or, or Lincoln Park. There's statues of Lincoln in Grant Park. There's statues of Lincoln in Lincoln Park. There's statues of Grant in Lincoln Park. There's General statues Logan. of Sheridan. And General Ge Logan. General Logan. Mm -hmm. They're all over the place. So uh, we drive cars with Land of Lincoln on the license plate. So it's just right below the surface. And what they really, all these things are, are clues that the Civil War generation purposely embedded in the landscape so what they did would not be forgotten. That this is what they thought was the great contribution of their generation. And I think that um, by doing a documentary uh, book, there's you get the voice of the people mm -hmm. and there's ways in which the, the flavor of that time and the emotion just comes out. I mean, I studied Irish, Irish American history, and the voices that come out of Irish Americans at that time and what they thought and what they felt it is something that I think a, a documentary book just can really, you know, make jump out for mm -hmm. people. In the, in the case of uh, uh, the Irish or uh, the immigrant communities at large, is there one particular uh, uh, one particular source that is particularly fruitful in finding the voices of? That's a cha that was a challenge we had writing this book because the fire burnt a lot of the <laughs> records, and so uh, you have to kind of dance around uh, this. And actually, it was the newspaper cover. It's a Tribune and uh, the Sun Times or the Times and. Um, you know, a few other places we even looked in, you know, surrounding nearby suburbs to see if somebody had deposited, you know, some, you know, memoirs or letters there. And so it was just trying to find bits and pieces, really. Mm -hmm. And it's there, but you really have to look. 
Uh, in in what ways would you say that a uh, uh, that a documentary history like this one is useful to students of of the war? I think you know the book was in many ways designed for that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you even worked up uh, discussion questions and study questions for students that's, that's part of the volume. But history is not, you know, we write history books. Uh, uh, John writes history books, <laughs> I write history yeah. books, Eileen writes history books. We, we believe in the writing of history, but history is a process. It's not something that's ever finished. Uh, this isn't the final word on civil war in Chicago, and there'll be more books on, on the Battle of Petersburg over time as well. And when you give people the raw material, you're offering to them the chance to go ahead and step in to the process and to make what they will of the raw materials. Okay. And, and I think also, um, it's a book, I mean, we like to have people read it from beginning to the end, but I think a documentary is some book that you can just flip through too and just read certain sections and just certain you know primary sources that just will give you a flavor for something mm -hmm. in a way that you know uh you know cover to cover you know secondary right it might be more intimidating and the book students. is useful that way you've organized it by topics right. and then the sources are within those mm -hmm. topics so uh i don't have the contents in front of me but it would be uh, the immigrant experience right. or uh, economics, uh, economics. Or, mm -hmm. you know, suffering will of women um, all those things are there okay John uh, you talked a little bit about uh, we talked about uh, the various battles that this covers so I want to start with thinking about the Battle of Deep Bottom and that uh, the operation that occurred uh, north of the James River. So if you could quickly tell us what Grant is trying to do in that operation, but I also want you to think about, uh, uh, if you can tell us, how well did Butler's troops and Meade's troops, two different Union armies fought? Elements of two different, how well did they work together? Did the armies have distinct characters and did it affect the outcome of the deep bottom, second deep bottom battle? Well, let me answer the first question first. Okay. <laughs> okay. The purpose was to keep Lee from shifting the scene of the war north. In other mm -hmm. words, Lee wanted to threaten Washington and force Grant to give up the siege of Petersburg. Mm -hmm. And Grant wanted to stop Lee from shifting too many forces up north to threaten Washington. And he did indeed stop him. That, this, the Battle of Second Deep Bottom, even though the Confederates largely trounced the Federals in the battle, Grant attained his end because Lee had to recall troops on the way to Northern Virginia. And as far as the, the interaction between the Northern forces were concerned, the Tenth Corps fought much more effectively than the famous Second Corps of the Army of the Potomac. The Tenth Corps was part of Butler's army. Mm -hmm. But the Tenth Corps had been resting for a long time. It hadn't really fought since June. And the Second Corps had fought in not only in June in the initial assaults on Petersburg, but it had fought in the second offensive in the late, the late, uh, the last part of June, and it also fought in first deep bottom at the end of July. The second core was used up probably by the, big, certainly by the end of the deep bottom operation, mm -hmm. and and it showed later in the campaign and at Reem Station when they collapsed. So yeah, the the it, both of the actions revealed uh, this once elite core starting to, to crumble? Yes, it, it collapsed at, mm -hmm. at uh, Ream Station. But it was a great, great core. 75 of the fighting 300 regiments belonged to the 2nd Corps. It was an awesome, it mm -hmm. was the, the greatest corps in the Union Army. 
Right. So but they had just reached the end of their line, or they'd reached the end of the. They'd been used up. You, Mead used Mead used them to go to Ream Station when Grant wanted the 18th Corps to go there. Mm -hmm. Meade used them twice in this operation. Grant only Grant wanted to use each of his corps once, mm -hmm. and the only corps that didn't fight really in this operation was the 18th Corps. Mm -hmm. So Meade did a poor job of personnel management. Right, moving moving these guys through the heat and and use overusing them. Overusing the Second mm -hmm. Corps. Uh, you know, I want to I want to share a, a a couple of artifacts uh, that obviously you can see behind John's head. We like to show the artifacts that we have here in the shop because we have them, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and those are chromolithographs, Middleton from from uh, Cincinnati, post war chromolithographs, the poor man's oil, uh, and they show U S Grant and. Uh, and Robert E. Lee, although the Robert E. Lee is Scoville. Uh, Scoville is the artist that did that. But I think these show us the way they want to, the people wanted to see Grant and Lee after the end of the war. These are the legendary Grant and Lee. John, in the, how did these two men affect each other in the, the operations you write about? They operated far more cautiously against one another than they had operated against any other opponent they faced. In other words, Grant operated more cautiously against Lee than against Pemberton or the people he faced at Fort Donaldson, and Lee operated far more cautiously against Grant than he had against Hooker or Burnside or McClellan or Polk. So in some cases, in some extent, they're fighting against each other's reputation? They were affected by it? They were fighting against each other's skill mm -hmm. and each other's will because both were both were great generals and and it usually takes uh, uh, great generals usually make their reputations against inferior generals, <laughs> not against equals. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna throw it back to, to you, uh, Eileen and Ted. Uh, one of the things we see from, from this book and when we look at Chicago and the Civil War, Chicago seems to have un, been unprepared for war. Uh, and uh, I, I think as early as, uh, it, it might be in the book, as early as January when Mississippi seceded, I think the Tribune declared in the city of 100,000 there's not even a single company of 100 men ready to go to the fight. Um, why do you think... Why do you think Chicago was unprepared initially for the war? And then what did they do? What did the town do? What did the city do to get prepared for war? Well, they weren't. They, they were organizationally unprepared, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But uh, mentally, I think they were keen for the conflict mm -hmm. uh, and had been anticipating the conflict at least, you know, since the summer of 1860, even, uh, that there was going to be a showdown. Uh, and the Republicans were going to stand by their message of not letting slavery expand, and which, of course, prompted secession. One of the reasons for that was, remember, Elmer Ellsworth uh, and the Zouave craze begins in Chicago. And this, has a, this is a militia revolution that sweeps all across the country, but especially the North, but even into the South. Uh, Zouave units were organized in imitation of these Chicago militiamen. Uh, when the time comes to organize troops, uh, when Lincoln puts out his call, for example, uh, it's men who had served among the, uh, Ellsworth's Zouaves, because by this time Ellsworth's in Washington, he's an assistant to President Lincoln, uh, and so it's his, uh, it's his subalterns who go ahead and start really organizing some of the better regiments that come out of Chicago. I think part of the, one of the things that, um, you need to remember too about Chicago, it was only 30 years old. <laughs> you know, in 1833, it's incorporated as a frontier town, and it's still the Union stockyards hadn't 
Kamyat, that was the a result of the war. You had cattle down the street, pigs down the street, you had grains. <laughs> I mean, it had a lot to do. And it was just a very, you know, trying to just get itself organized. And, it, and the war focuses that attention. But to begin with, there's just so many things Chicago still has to do just to be, you know, a premier city. And it's competing with St. Louis and Cincinnati. And, and so economically, it, it was more... F- you know, focus, and it was thinking about how to organize for a war that nobody thinks is going to last more than three months. Right. Yeah. Certainly, municipal leadership was weak. I mean, the mayor only is office for a year, mm-hmm. you know, so they just get comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> they can hardly get some graft going. <laughs> and then we got a new mayor. Right. Yeah. How many mayors during the war? Is it four? There's one. Uh, no, Sherman uh, has uh, is reelected for a second term. Okay. Yeah, Francis Sherman in the middle of the war, sixty two, sixty four. One of the, uh, when people visit us here at the bookshop, uh, when they come from out of town, if they're tourists uh, uh, of uh, Chicago in the Civil War or coming to see great places in Chicago, for the people that come to Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, the first question is always, where was the wigwam? <laughs> I want to see the wigwam. Yeah, that'd be nice. Um, <laughs> so I, I, there's more to that. I think there's more answer than there is to question mm-hmm. there. But Answer that question for me, would you? In the in terms of mm-hmm. what happened to the wigwam, yeah. where this great it? building, you know, they, mm-hmm. the great Republican wigwam, it was the largest, had the largest interior space of any structure in the United States when it was completed just before the uh, Republican Convention mm-hmm. in the summer of 1860. Well, uh, the uh, uh, the wigwam uh, is gone. Uh, sometime we don't know exactly when. It's gone sometime around 64, 65. It seems to have burned down or something. Um, they used it for public meetings for at the beginning of the war. Uh, Stephen Douglas gives a famous speech there to rally the city. Uh, that it's turned into a, like a, a series of shops, like an arcade. Uh, but uh, if you want to visit the site today, you go to 33 East Wacker. This is uh, on, the, uh, on the banks of the Chicago River. Um, there's a beautiful uh, curving glass structure there uh, that sits where the wigwam once was. Mm-hmm. That seems to be the answer to most questions mm-hmm. about historic Chicago. I can send you to the place on the map where it used to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, this book was going to have pictures of those places, and it just seemed ridiculous. <laughs> this is where something else was, and now this is there, and there, forget it. This, there may have been two other things <laughs> yeah. uh, during the course of it. Um, and I don't know, I think in my mind that speaks to, even goes back to the last question you were talking about. The people in Chicago, it's a new city. I think it stayed new. It stayed new until 2015. It's constantly, <laughs> you know, people are constantly changing or reinventing or doing something else. Yeah. Um, uh, which, which, as you pointed out, Ted, doesn't mean they're not prepared to fight, but the institutions kind of may not be That's the place. problem. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a question from you at home. Uh, and so, of course, I'm, like I said, I'm very interested in having you folks send the questions. If you just want to ask the questions, I'll sit here and read them. <laughs> but this is a question uh, for you, John. And it's from uh, Larry in Linden, Michigan. Thank you, Larry. Can the Weldon Railroad battlefield be visited today? And has it been preserved or is it lost? Well, thanks, Larry. If if by the Weldon Railroad battlefield you mean the Globe Tavern battlefield, there are still parts of it, yes, that you can visit. There's a uh, monument to the South Carolinians who were decimated on August 21st. The Weldon Railroad battlefield can be visited. It's about five or six miles directly south of Petersburg. I've walked uh, parts of the battlefield. There are some that are parts of the battlefield that are built over, but uh, the farther the farther south you get, um, it's, it's still um, in existence. The Ream Station battlefield is, is better preserved, and in, in fact, I think the Civil War Trust has has bought a little bit of property out that way, and it's mm-hmm. it's also bought some property, I believe, up at up at Deep Bottom. Mm-hmm. So, all, parts of all three battlefields 
can be walked today. More at Deep Bottom and at Ream Station than at the Weldon Railroad or Globe Tavern, whatever, whichever you want to call the, the battle in the middle. Yeah, and I was thinking, I was thinking of asking you that. Has the Civil War Trust done any has done valuable work on these battlefields, or is there still more to work? As far as I know, it has. Up at Deep Bottom and down at Ream Station, I'm not aware of activity around Globe Tavern, but don't quote me. Okay. I, I, I'm not an expert. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know of that. Uh, I want to show another artifact here, and in this case we have an original engraving, original steel engraving from uh, battles and leaders of the Civil War, the famous collection of primary source uh, articles, essays, written um, yeah, yeah. The, pardon me, this is the original sketch. It's not the engraving. The engravings are in the books. <laughs> this is the original hand-drawn sketch. Um, and in this case, it's a picture of Fort Sedgwick, uh, known as Fort Hell. Uh, and, of course, during these operations, the lines still need to be held, John, didn't they? Right. And uh, so tell us a little bit about... Uh, you know about about Fort Hell, as far as you know, and, and what needed to be done to hold the lines while the while the operations went on. Well, fewer men were needed to hold the fort 